Welcome to Indianomics. The southern states of Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu protested last week against the alleged injustice meted out to them in the devolution of taxes from the shareable pool. Let me start with a brief explainer. Under the Indian constitution, most of the large taxes like income tax, customs and excise are collected by the centre, but they have to be shared by the centre with the states as per formulas arrived at by the finance commissions appointed every five years. The 16th finance commission has just been appointed. Now, the previous, that is the 15th finance commission divided taxes between states based on income distance. That is how poor or rich a state is versus the national average. The share is also based on population of the states according to the 2011 census and on the basis of the demographic performance, that is which states have done more for population control. The net result of these criteria has been that shares of some states like Kerala, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, which are richer and have falling populations, find that their share from the central pool has been declining compared to the 14th Finance Commission versus the 15th Finance Commission. Now, Karnataka's share, for instance, has fallen from 4.7% uh, of uh, the uh, total taxes to 3.6%. Kerala's has fallen from 2.5% to 1.9%. Tamil Nadu's is mostly static. The wrath of these states is that they contribute most to the central kitty, but are increasingly getting less and less, and probably being punished because they have controlled population better. Now, CNBC TV18 is seeking to understand the complaints of various states over a two-part series. Today, in part one, I have with me the IT Minister of the state of Tamil Nadu, Mr. Painivel Tyagarajan. Uh, Mr. PTR, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, first up, uh, you can't fault the manner in which the formulas are arrived at. The Finance Commission chairman have been... Uh, people beyond question, haven't they? You don't doubt that part of the sharing. Well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, let me point out that this problem is not a problem between the 14th and the 15th Finance Commission. This is a problem that has been uh, secularly moving in the wrong way, at least as far back as I can trace it, going back probably to the 9th or the 10th Finance Commission, so 25, 30 years. And the core of the problem is this. The way the formulas are allocated, in fact, between 14 and 15, there were only two changes, substantive changes, like which population to take, 71 population or 2011 population, yes. and one other change. But the overall way of allocating these funds largely is about population, what they call uh, a gap between your potential and where you are. You know, Basically, the poorer you are, the more money you get. Right? It's, it's not a bad idea. But the problem of all these finance commissions, and I said this while I was in opposition back in 2017 or 18 when I appeared before the 15th Finance Commission as an opposition representative when they came to Chennai, I said, you say the Finance Commission's ambitions are transparency, equity, and efficiency. Transparency, we can all agree. We want it to be done in a very clear way. Everybody understands why. But if you say efficiency and equity, then I must point out that for 25 years, you have been failing spectacularly because you keep on taking more and more money away from the well-to-do states. Happens to be most of them are Southern, but you take away also from Gujarat, also from Maharashtra, and you keep on giving it to the poorer and weaker states. And that happens in all federal societies. But in most federal societies, if you take the money from the better off and give it to the less well off, the gap closes. They start getting somehow more aligned together and the equity comes in out of this fund transfer. But for 25 years across all governments and all parties, you find the gap is not closing, it's not stable, it's not widening, it's accelerating in its widening. The poor are getting poorer, poorer on a relative basis and the rich are getting richer and richer. So something you're doing is profoundly wrong this transference of money is not getting you the outcomes that it should, that it gets in the European Union or in China or in America. What is it that you're doing wrong? And then I propose some things that they should do differently. So this is a long-standing problem. It's not a 15th or 16th finance commission problem. It's like a 30-year problem. No, I take your point. It's just that I couldn't, in my introduction, give you a bar chart uh, over uh, you know, the last uh, 16 commissions. But I take your point uh, that broadly, the more developed and the more disciplined states on population 
uh, have been only paying and receiving less. Now, uh, 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 Mr. PTR, nevertheless, one has to follow that principle of equity, isn't it? Uh, it will take time for a large state uh, or for a seriously underdeveloped state like Bihar to catch up with developed states. The uh, southern states, and it's not only the southern states, as you pointed out, western states like Gujarat and Maharashtra, have the advantage of ports, a geographical advantage, which historically has meant more developed cities. They've also had the advantage of uh, uh, school education coming in earlier, probably 100 years before, say, Banaras Hindu University or uh, Aligarh Muslim University was created. It's a historical geographical uh, advantage. And so it will take 100 years to resolve. Uh, can we be impatient? Yeah, I, I think the profound difference between you and me is not how long that I would expect it to compare to you. Okay. I am concerned that the gap is widening and accelerating in its widening. I'm sure, I am concerned that there's no sign of it starting to close. Once it starts to close, you and I may argue whether it'll take one generation or three or five. I might argue about other variables, that what you point out may or may not be relevant about coast and what day education started is quite varied between Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. That's not, the, you know, those are all nuanced questions of policy. The profound difference between you and me, I say it is getting worse and it okay. is not starting to move in the right direction. You say, will it take 20 years or 50 years? Maybe it will. Let's have that debate later. Okay. After it starts to converge, we're we keeping on diverging. That's why I said to the Finance Commission back five years ago, six years ago, I said, you are incentivizing the wrong things and you are not incentivizing the right things. Profoundly, basically, core... Mm -hmm. If 100% of the children are not in school, if your graduation rates out of elementary school and then middle school and then higher secondary school and then going into tertiary education are not improving, how do you expect to ever have lasting effects? It's like you're not building the infrastructure for growth. So let, let me give you an example. The average education in Bihar today is elementary school dropout. What work is being done to fix that problem? If that problem is not fixed, I don't see how you're going to fix any other problem, how much ever money I give you. That's my basic issue. Okay. Now, I take your point on that, but uh, the 16th Finance Commission has just had its first meeting, its inaugural meeting. How would you have them resolve this? How do you measure efficiency of these lines across a fund of indicators like, you know, health, maternal mortality, infant mortality? Uh, is it even possible? Won't it get too complex? It's not at all, not to me, maybe to some. To me, it's very clear. I gave the suggestion, I gave two suggestions for equity and efficiency going back six years ago. In my first presentation, I said, if you want uh, equity, make sure that nobody gets less than one third or one fourth or 40% of the amount they pay in. And except in rare circumstances, nobody gets out more than three or four times what they pay in because smaller states will have much less paid in. So it's, mm -hmm. it's actually a workable formula. Right now, you're letting it go excessively to one side. Some states get back 20 times, 30 times what they paid in, or 50 times, like Arunachal Pradesh, right? Yes. Let's not do that. As for efficiency, I said, you incentivize today. You say your next year's payment will be based on what percentage of your children, including girls, including minorities, including Dalits, are actually in the education system. Two years later, you say, what percentage of them are getting out of elementary school with basic reading and writing? Five years later, you say, how many of them have gone to middle school? You start incentivizing that and say, based on that, I'll give you more money. That will lead you to start to close the gap. If you keep on saying, the poorer you are, I'll give you more money. It's like trying to build a house without any uh, frame or steel frame, right? You keep building it, it'll keep falling down. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the infrastructure to actually improve your society if you don't have 100% catchment in education. Why don't you incentivize that? In, that? in that particular instance, I said, on the percentage of girls, because that's the actual indicator. I said, what percentage of girls are in elementary school? First time. Second time, what percentage of them get to middle school? Third time, what percentage of them get access to menstrual health and continue to high school? Because there's a very clear research that shows that if they don't get menstrual health, they don't continue to high school. Mm. So these are indicators that if you incentivize them, you will actually have a hope of closing the gap right now. The money keeps on widening in terms of how much you take away and how much you give. And the, and the outcome keeps on getting worse and worse and worse. Okay. Uh, well, would that therefore be your request to the 16th Finance Commission as well? That uh, performance indicators be uh, put in and given some weightage? 
I, I, I'll give you a more nuanced answer. You must pick leading indicators because if you try, let, let me let me give you actual, you know, many of your viewers are quantitative guys like I used to be back in the financial services industry. I'll give you a simple math. The finance commission's formulas are set in stone for five years. Usually start getting worked out two years before the five-year period starts. starts. And are, are submitted to the government about a year before. So what the finance commission is really trying to do is predict T plus one to T plus six years forward, yeah. what each state and the union's growth is going to be in absolute and relative terms. And based on that, tries to tell you how much of the money should be given to whom. It is an exercise in futility. If you go and look at any state's budget or you look at the government of India's budget, under the FRBM Act and equivalence, we're supposed to give once every, you know, every year we're supposed to give the T plus two year for forward forecast of our economies and our budgets. Compare that to what happens actually being presented two years later. That itself we are living in like hit or miss land. Absolutely. The odds that one finance commission in one, two year or three year period can get this right is exactly zero. Okay. So I told them two things. I said, don't set formulas in stone for five years. Have the formula be variable within a band and variable based on short term performance analysis because it doesn't take a lot for you to increase the number of children in elementary school. Mm -hmm. Every year you can improve that. Every year, a new batch is coming, okay. right? Okay. So I said, you guys are trying to set in form formulas in stone based on projections that are random numbers effectively, and you're doing it on the wrong random numbers, okay. right? You're doing it on the wrong variables. Okay. Okay. So your suggestion is that it should be a dynamic distribution based on leading indicators. Uh, I take a point. As opposed to lagging indicators. What they use right now are lagging indicators. How poor are you? Mm. How many of you, uh, you know, have been born? These are lagging indicators. You have to have leading indicators. If I start looking at how many of you are in school now, I know how many of you are going to be productive 10 years from now, okay. right? Okay. So I say use leading indicators and keep dynamic allocations. That was my suggestion then. It's my suggestion now. Okay. Uh, well, the other problem uh, is that uh, the total central kitty does not come only through tax devolution. A lot of it comes through grants. And those grants are tied to specific central schemes, which uh, uh, are not perhaps relevant for the more developed states. So in any case, when you count the overall distribution of resources, it's just likely that the other developed states will get more because uh, the central schemes are designed for them. So is there a, a point that there should be less in terms of grants and more in terms of, uh, you know, arithmetic tax devolution? Would that be your argument? Yeah, let me make three points. Where does the money for the schemes come from? It doesn't fall from the sky, right? The central government or the union government is somehow raising that money. How is it raising it? It's raising it from cesses and surcharges or its share of the central uh, tax pool devolution. So what has systematically happened is three things. Systematically, the ratio of cesses and surcharges in the total collection has gone from 8 or 9% in 2014 I agree it was a bad idea in the UPA. I'm not excusing it. Mm. The notion of cesses and surcharges itself is wrong. Many people have said it, not just me. But cesses and surcharges, because they're not in the divisible pool, it was 8 or 9%. The door was opened badly by then UPA finance ministers. And now it has become 22, 23% of the total tax collection. That's where the union government gets to play politics with the money mm -hmm. and start saying they'll be called this. You have to put the prime minister's face. You have to put the prime minister's name. Otherwise, we won't give you money. This year, it'll be 80, 20. Next year, it'll be 20, 80. All of this strong arming and politicization of fund flows is open through the cesses and surcharges first. It's not like the money falls from the sky. All, all of India is in some state, right? It's not like this. Either the, other than a few union territories, the rest is physically, the land is in some state. The tax revenue is not coming from heaven. It's coming from some state. So they find a way to bucketize it. So I've said it again. Before I say it again, the percentage of our tax money that comes back, even though the, the, the bulk of it is only about 25-27% in a state like Tamil Nadu, even that money doesn't come in untied, uh, what do you say, share taxes. It comes increasingly in tied funds to those schemes on their conditions with their picture and their model. Okay. And those funds are not enough. Very often, if they have like a housing scheme, they give you one lakh. We have to put five lakhs to make it viable because they're a high cost state. Mm. So we put five lakhs out of the six lakhs and we still have to call it PMXYZ scheme and still have to put the PM's picture. Otherwise, they won't even give us that one lakh. So I would say in a nutshell that this government has levered up on some bad loopholes that were introduced by previous governments. Yet they have levered it to the hilt 
and they have completely politicized the allocation model. Okay. And I'm sure you saw in this year's budget, the allocation to the state of UP alone was 2,30,000 crores. The allocation to all five southern states together was 1,90 or 92,000 crores. So we got about 85 or 88 percent of the allocation to one state was all our states together. If you look at the tax payments, all us five together would have paid in three or five times what UP paid. That's how skewed the number is. Okay. If it was just tax devolution based on the Finance Commission formula, that would not happen. Mm -hmm. It's because 20 percent, 25 percent of the pool is being siphoned off somewhere and then on the whims and fancies of one individual or one ruling party is being sent. Okay. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, Mr. PTR, on the question of cesses, that's a very touchy topic. Uh, I have to take a commercial break. We will continue the discussion on cesses and on the divisible pool on the other side of this break. Welcome back to this Indianomics two-part special on center state finances. In the first of the series, I'm speaking with the IT minister of the state of Tamil Nadu, Mr. Payanimil Tyagarajan. Uh, we were just speaking to him about the tricky issue of cesses, which has decreased the shareable resources, the shareable taxes, which include, of course, income tax, customs and excise. Uh, 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 Mr. PTR, I take your point that cesses have... Uh, you know, overwhelmed uh, and reduced the amount of shareable resources. But uh, a, a large part of this increase in CES, or at least a substantial part of the increase in CES, is also because of the compensation CES. If you take that out, perhaps, and the compensation CES was for GST, then perhaps the sin looks a little less. Absolutely not, for two reasons. One, the compensation CES is over. It's dead, according to the union government. Okay. It died last June. So it's a 0% now of the cesses are going through GST. Even when it was, it was less than 2 or 3% of all cesses collected, meaning if total cesses were 20 to 23%, the GST compensation cess was 2 or 3%. So let's not find like backdoors to explain this away. Okay. The reality is that this is kind of uh, systematic political allocation of resources to those states where the government in Delhi thinks it has the right vote share and taking it away in every way possible from those states where it thinks that it does not got a right vote share. This is as political a financial decision as any you can ever see. Oh, uh, Mr. Tyagarajan, that would be going uh, uh, a stretch too far. Haryana and Punjab have also been receiving much less of taxes, uh, much less of uh, revenues from the central government compared to their taxes. Of course, all the five southern states are there, but also in that list is Haryana. And likewise, the states which receive more than they give also includes Rajasthan, which until recently was not a BJP state and, uh, you know, uh, which was uh, uh, getting the benefit. Uh, for that matter, even West Bengal, traditionally a non-BJP uh, uh, or non-central government state. Concede, always, I yeah. Argument, I won't concede your argument. I'll go another way. I would say it turns out that those states that have high education high growth, okay. high development, and low population growth rates okay. tend to not vote for the BJP. Okay. And those states where that is the opposite, at least in the union elections, in the MP elections, tend to seem to vote for the BJP. That's the only point I'm making. Okay. Would your advice, therefore, be that there should be a cap on the cess amount? Because a cess will always be needed. Like in 1971, we needed a war veteran cess after the 71 war. So you don't conceptually go against the cess, but you want uh, to put a limit on the amount that can be set aside as cess. Would that be your uh, ask of the Finance Commission? I have two very specific asks. One, cesses should only be temporary in nature for specific needs at specific times, like a war, like a pandemic. There should be no permanent cesses, number one. And I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. Many, many people have made that point. Number two, the notion of centrally sponsored schemes itself is antithetical to the original constitutional design. Because a lot of the subjects on which there are centrally sponsored schemes are actually state subjects. So to me, if you want the purity of the constitution of 1951, what you want is to have no cesses except in special circumstances for limited periods and get out of the centrally sponsored schemes business because you, want, you can't fund them through cesses. Put the money into the ratio according to the finance commission it may have many inefficiencies. I think it can do a better job, but that's a different day, different debate. 
And then at least you'll have some reasonable predictability and remove the politics from these kinds of decisions. Okay. So what, may I say that, you know, your main point is uh, let there be tax devolution only, that grants and central schemes be reduced to the absolute minimum. Uh, or should they be done away with altogether? What would your ask be? That, that, that's my point. My point is that through N.K. Singh, as I said, the, the Finance Commission chairman of the Philippine Finance Commission and a very respected member of the elite in this uh, you know, uh, realm, he himself raised the question that it's a legitimate question to ask, why should there be centrally sponsored schemes? Right? It's like you trying to insert yourself into state subjects using some central design. Is that is that really in keeping with the spirit of the constitution? And I say this apart from par parties, right? Okay. UPA governments did it, NDA governments do it. I still say, you see, the, 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 the clarity of a guy like me, I talk about values, I talk about the constitution, I talk about economic policy. It doesn't matter if it's done by party A or party B, my party or the opposition party, right is still right and wrong is still wrong. Yes. So I'm okay. still saying it was wrong then and it's wrong now. Okay. All right, well, just a final point. Would you therefore also want something like a fiscal council, which uh, the 14th Finance Commission had recommended, which is, you know, a constitutional body outside the realm of uh, the state and the central uh, 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 governments, something like the Finance Commission, which is a sitting council that uh, looks into the injustices on an ongoing basis and does the calculations, uh, you know, more ethically. Would, you, would that be an ask? Were such a council to be structured in a way that it functioned truly independent of the government of India and the party in power, I would be all for it. But my, my experience on the GST council, though it is supposed to be the epitome of federalism right now, I make this point that the meetings themselves are very, you know, full of decorum. The union finance minister is always unfailingly courteous, gives everybody time to speak and all that. But the design from how the agenda gets set to who gets to frame the GOM, who gets to set their mandate, their chairman, who gets to decide what topics go to fitment committee, who gets to decide what topics go to law committee, who gets to decide you know, which is voted on on what day. All of this is 100% in the control of the union finance ministry, who also have a 30% vote in a quorum that requires 75% to pass any resolution. That means they can't do anything. So I'm saying, if that itself is designed that way, and that is supposed to be the height of federalism, I don't be, you know, I, I'm not hopeful that we'll design some other body that will be truly open to a neutral Fair enough. discussion. Okay, well, then uh, a no for the Fiscal Council, but the main ask of the IT Minister of Tamil Nadu, speaking, I think, for many of this, uh, uh, the richer states, the more developed states, is that the amount of grants and centrally sponsored schemes be reduced, let there be more of tax devolution, and let there not be a reduction in the divisible pool by taking out some in terms of cesses. That's the main ask from the IT Minister. Mr. Painimil Tyagarajan, thank you very much for joining us in this first edition of our Central State uh, this, uh, Devolution Discussion. Thank you. With that, we wrap up on this edition of Indianomics. Thank you very much for watching.